Good afternoon. I'm Chris Cooney with the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome to our seventh in the series of COVID recovery, business recovery mostly, uh, Zoom calls that we've been conducting uh, since uh, late March, I believe. And uh, so here we are, seven weeks later. Um, we want to, uh, we want to, um, you know, just remind you, we're going to receive updates from local, state, uh, and federal officials today. We, we're going to be joined by a couple of additional uh, Massachusetts-based organizations that assist businesses, so we're excited about that. Uh, this is a Zoom call, and it is being recorded, uh, just so you know, and it will be posted to the Metro South Chamber dot website, which has become a real great central collection uh, spot for resources, uh, both in terms of uh, like score counseling, but also finance. Uh, grants, loans, and information about uh, how to get back to work. There's some sample programs and plans there for things you might want to consider as you consider reopening your business or your return to businesses as a customer, uh, both. So uh, again, we're expecting uh, about 100 people. We've been averaging about 100 uh, on these calls. Uh, there is a Q&A button just down on the bottom. Uh, if you have a question, please post your question there in that section, and panelists have agreed to respond directly to you, to your question. So that's been a great resource, and we've received some nice comments about uh, getting those uh, answered. In addition, many of our panelists are available after. They'll all post their uh, contact information down below, and if you have a follow-up question or you have a friend who has a follow-up question or you, you think of something else later on, then reach out to them. Uh, they have been great about getting back to folks and uh, helping them through their, their issues. Uh, as I said, we have additional three resources that we've added to the call. Uh, one is from the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center. Uh, that's Jill. And then we have uh, John, who you can see here, John Fitzpatrick with the Massachusetts Supplier Diversity Office. And then we have Steve McAllister, who runs the New England uh, office for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's going to be joining us a little bit late. Before we hear from them and our other panelists, I would like to ask you uh, to respond to a poll question. Uh, this is one of the features of Zoom. We haven't really used it, but we are uh, recording workshops that are helpful and top topical for our businesses. And uh, we've want to kind of prioritize what we record and post. There's already maybe five or six uh, videos recorded with uh, various industry experts uh, on uh, dealing with some of the issues that uh, businesses are facing because of the situation. Uh, but Lexi, you want to throw up the poll and uh, you as a participant can respond to this poll. And it's basically just uh, letting us know what uh, topic you would like to see uh, conducted or, or addressed in a, a, a video workshop. Um, we will then pursue those in the order in which we uh, get a response and then we will post those videos uh, to the resource page. So you can see the question is what topics would you like covered in future meetings either here or again covered in an informational video. And you see crisis management is uh, the top. Managing remote workers uh, is second. Strategies to return for profitability uh, is the next answer. Uh, help with PPP and EIDL applications. We still have uh, monies available there. We're gonna hear from SBA regarding that today. Uh, there are funds available, but what we're finding is some folks would like assistance with filling out the application. Uh, and uh, in some cases, it's a, an issue of uh, foreign language and uh, we have resources for you for that uh, as well. We can talk about unemployment information. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and we get at least half the calls each week are on unemployment questions, uh, and some relate to PPP, others relate just to uh, everyday uh, run of the mill, you know, whether they qualify and how they file and that type of thing. Uh, and then strategies for rehiring. We're thinking optimistically and down the line, uh, when we get through some of this, uh, you, know, you need help in rehiring. So if you can just check, uh, I think you're only allowed to check one uh, and then hit submit, then uh, we will have the results uh, from there. Um, so I'm gonna try mine here. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so I just put mine in. People wanna uh, respond, just take a moment to respond. And uh, Lexi, I think, is going to post the results. Yes, it looks like we have about 70% voted, so I'll just give it another minute. 
Okay. So the organization that we were talking about that provides assistance uh, to small business owners who may need help with uh, with an, another language and English proficiency uh, is Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation. They are providing uh, direct assistance to companies that want to apply uh, for SBA programs and they will sit down with you, match you up with someone in your language to help you, guide you through that application process. So again, that's Massachusetts Growth Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation, and I'll ask Lexi to post their uh, website and their contact information down below as well. So why don't we show the results of what we have so far? And Okay, so clearly strategies to return to profitability. Amen, right? So that's where we're all kind of heading. Uh, the next is crisis management. I think we're all still in the midst of it, and, and some of us are still in shock in terms of everything that's occurred in the last uh, seven weeks. And then uh, strategies for rehiring. So there's some optimism in the, uh, the, the, the crew as well. Uh, so that's great. So we will take that information and we will follow up on it and we'll either bring in speakers to, for this series or and or uh, record an elongated session via Zoom and then post that to the COVID recovery site at metrosouthchamber.com. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the mayor of Brockton, uh, Robert Sullivan, who uh, is doing yeoman's work. I mean, I am on calls with him at least a couple of times a week. Uh, I know he's on uh, with many of our board members at the chamber, uh, whether it's healthcare industry or banking. And uh, I know, Mayor, we talked earlier today and you've got some new information. Uh, welcome. I do. Thank you, Chris. And uh, seven weeks has gone by awful quick and uh, it's still a daunting task, but I want to thank you and, and the SBA and of course, Margaret, uh, for being on on a regular basis. It's extremely helpful to Brocktonians and business owners. Uh, worst part of my job is, is getting the numbers every day. So 167 deaths, that's the most recent count of loss of life in the city of Brockton. Good news is um, yesterday, current active cases with 2,278 Brocktonians dealing with COVID and it's gone down, it's 1874 now. So we're seeing some recovery, which is really, really wonderful. Um, also just want to uh, thank again the, the governor and lieutenant governor for stepping up and giving us increased testing capability. Chris, as you know, there's a wonderful collaboration between the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center and Signature Brockton Hospital at Brockton High School, which is 470 Forest Ave. It started on Monday and it's a test site facility that you drive up. You have to call in advance. Um, I'll give you the number and then we can send it on the uh, email, but it's 844-483. 7819 again 844 483 7819 it's for any essential worker in brockton anybody that may have been exposed to COVID, or anybody that's showing symptoms of the COVID 19 virus 180 people were tested there yesterday i just got off a call a little while ago we're looking at about 200 today as well so this is a game changer this is what what people can accomplish when we work together and uh another piece of information i wanted to share i participated yesterday uh, on a haitian uh, town hall and the day before in a Cape Verdean uh, town hall with uh, partners in health from the state and neighborhood health center. Um, contact tracing services is gonna be extremely important here in the city of Brockton. So if anybody gets a caller ID and it says MA COVID team, mass COVID team, please answer that. That is the state working with us to, uh, to help do the tracing. Um, wanted to share some good news. Uh, I was on a call of course the other night with uh, Marty Walsh. We do four calls a week. Uh, Tom Koch from Quincy's on there, 13 different mayors, and the governor came on and, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, next steps as we move forward and his date of the 18th, but good piece of information for Brockton. Um, Stop and Shop was going to leave on Belmont Street, Route 123 across from Brockton High. Uh, corporate offices in the City of Presidents over in Quincy, right, with our hold. Uh, but in the City of Champions, we couldn't afford to have another vacant building, especially on a, on a main uh, highway. Um, I spoke to the powers that be and I said, listen, let's think how we can get to yes and keep it here. Um, and um, thanks to the efforts of, of the, uh, the corporate officers, um, 50 new positions are coming to Brockton. It's going to be a virtual shopping, their Peapod. Virtual shopping is key right now in the COVID-19 experience. Um, you, you shop online, you can either drive up or they'll deliver um, to your doorstep. Uh, I said out of those 50 employees, let's have Brockton resident preference. They agreed to that. They also agreed to register every delivery vehicle in the city of Brockton for excise tax purposes. So it's a win-win. 
uh, and in light of all the sadness that I get, that's something that I wanted to share. That's a positive endeavor. And again, it's about working together, rolling up the sleeves and getting the job done. So Chris, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your leadership. And I look forward to uh, listening once again this week and I'll be on again next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That's great news. Uh, and also the, the tracing is great news. I mean, that's really where they're talking about the whole country needs to be. And yet Brockton's here before many other communities. So that should be a, a great uh, asset and, and uh, maybe a shorten, uh, shorten this experience uh, for us. I, you know, the essential worker designation expands. Uh, it's fairly expansive. I mean, it goes to manufacturers. It goes to a grocery store. It goes to cleaning companies. Uh, gas stations, all those folks you're saying can call that number you provided and be eligible for t immediate testing, correct? A absolutely. You'll get your results within 48 hours. And it's just streamlined so beautiful. You come in the Forest Ave entrance to Brockton High, you go by Marciano Stadium. There's one tent dedicated to uh, testing for a neighborhood health center. The other tent is dedicated to Signature Brockton Hospital. It's been seamless. And I truly appreciate the staffing done by those medical facilities. It's been a win-win for everybody. Now, that is not just Brockton, correct? Anybody from the surrounding towns can call in and, and be tested there as well if they're essential? I believe that they're limiting it right now to Brockton uh, because okay. the Quest supplies of the increased testing uh, is dedicated to Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. So at this time, I believe it's just Brockton, Chris. Um, but I, I'm hopeful, and I got off a call a little while ago with Kim Hall, the CEO at the hospital, and Sue Joss, executive director. And, uh, you know, we're looking to expand that. And I know Lieutenant Governor um, sent me a text the other day, and you know, we're all in this together. So as of right now, it's Brockton, uh, but I'm not going to okay. be surprised if we can expand that next week. All right. That's great. And then lastly, you know, you and I talked about uh, using Zoom more uh, for the municipal uh, meetings and whatnot. And I know I saw the planning board recently posted a meeting for, for May, which is great. Any word on zoning or, or anything along those lines? Yeah, yeah. No, so we're working. The only one that I think might be a little hiccup right now is license commission. Um, but, you know, conservation and ZBA, ZBA and planning, the two most important in my humble uh, opinion. So um, we, we, uh, we, you and I, Chris, were on a call earlier. I'm going to have a Zoom call with you and myself and um, the building commissioner, uh, also um, um, uh, the, 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 the chair of, of the planning and Rob May will be on there as well. So um, listen, it's all, it's all full steam ahead right now. Uh, unfortunately, there's going to be some hearings that we won't be able to do with Zoom quite yet. We're trying to still iron out the wrinkles. But as I said in the past, hey, if the NFL could do a draft on Zoom, we could do it here in Brockton and we will do it. That's great to hear, Mayor. Thanks so much again for your leadership. We appreciate it. Thank you. Stay so, safe. Thank you. So I'm going to move over to Margaret LaForest, who I know just got off the phone uh, with the Secretary of Economic Development and Housing, also the Secretary of Labor. I think the Lieutenant Governor is usually on that call. Uh, hi, Margaret. She's our liaison for the Mass Office Business Development and the Regional Economic Development Organization. So, Margaret, how are you? Great. Thank you so much. And um, as you know, the governor himself does it, and usually with the lieutenant governor or a member of his team, of the administration, um, has daily updates. And just so that you know, you can tune into the latest information. Every morning they post it on mass.gov. The time varies each day. Today is at 2.30, so I'll be uh, hitting the replay after this call myself. But uh, Mayor Sullivan should know that he was recognized in the work you were just talking about in the testing and tracing in Brockton was recognized specifically by Governor Baker this week on his one of his daily updates and um, so let's get into kind of the, the hot topics of the week of Secretary of the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development Keneally with Lieutenant Governor Polito are the co-chairs of the Reopening Economy Advisory Board. They have been very busy working with over 50 different industry groups met with over a hundred which represent um, well over a hundred thousand companies over 2 million workers and really are out there listening right now to the different industry groups. So if anybody is looking to provide input to the reopening advisory board, I welcome you to contact me and I can get you connected there. Um, I think what's really important in the messaging is that May 18th is the date that, and Chris, you did a great job with this last week, is that that's the date the reopening advisory board report will be released to the public and will really lay out the strategic plan of how we're going to be phasing the reopening. So no flipping of the switch on May 18th for open for business, uh, rather a gradual phase strategic reopening um, with understandings of the health metric data where we are to align which phase would open when. 
very specific by industry, um, what the information they're gathering is about business readiness, and also the enablers that are needed to support that reopening, such as childcare and transportation. So anybody looking to give feedback on that, please be in touch and I can get you connected. The, and then stay tuned because we are um, seeing things expand as far as, you know, this week you heard about golf. I know Brockton has some golf courses, um, but also retail operations were just given a little bit of flexibility. And while your retail operation, if you're a non-essential retail, needs to remain closed to the public, you're allowed to bring in some small, a small amount of employees um, to do remote fulfillment. So if you are pivoting to e-commerce, for example, and want to bring some employees into package, uh, into ship, you could do that. But maybe non-essential uh, manufacturing would be, if you're creating it, would be stopped, but be shipping. Uh, for example, florist, it's Mother's Day this weekend, and I'm sure there's a, a great florist member of the chamber that you can give a shout out to, but the florist. So that no contact delivery, that floral arrangement is an example. The funds could be paid over the phone and that delivery driver could drop it off the door without any contact. And that would be an example of something that's been allowed to recently move forward. And we have posted the guidance as far as safe operations, social distancing, um, sanitation, what, to, what is needed to safely have those operations happen. So glad to answer questions about that and direct you to that updated guidance. Um, Let's see. Oh, on the unemployment insurance. This is great. I just got this. Literally, I hang up from that call and tune into you without able to do the homework because uh, you've got this so well timed. It's hot mm -hmm. off the press. But um, wasn't Secretary Coster, but one of her um, leads on the unemployment joined us today. And they've published two guides that I think are going to be tremendous value. And I'll get these links to you. I haven't even looked them up yet. Um, but one is about uh, guidance, kind of a guidebook for employers and one for the employee about, there's a ton of questions right now about returning to work when we reopen the economy. What if, um, what if an unemployment, an employee claimant on unemployment insurance doesn't refuse, refuses to return to work, for example. And we're talking about the documentation that you should be providing, you know, how you offer the job in writing to the employee that they communicated they're refusing it to you, the questions you should be asking and the information you should be providing um, to unemployment for action. So I know there is a lot of questions around that. I'm sure I can get more into that in next week's call, but I will give you the links for the guide for the employees on that um, and the guide for the workers. So, um, they kind of are giving you some guidance on specifics, what information they're looking for from the employer. So I will get that to you. Um, obviously, unemployment in, in Massachusetts, the numbers are high. We, when we started this, we're at 2%. And we're now over 25% with over a million claimants filing for unemployment insurance. So the numbers are big. Um, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions as I can. It's to part of your Q&A. Great, thank you, Margaret. You know, one of the quotes I heard the mayor say uh, today was, you know, and I think he was quoting the governor actually, uh, the governor said that the reopening will not be determined by date, it'll be determined by data. Uh, and that's how they're going to progress. It, you started with that comment about the 18th, and you know, I'm telling people really in reality, this is gonna be phased and it's likely to not, we're not gonna see phase one maybe even until Memorial Day or after Memorial Day and then, and then from there. But I'm sure the governor in his daily briefings will give us a better idea as, as we go. Uh, well, that's terrific information. I know there are a lot of questions from employers now about getting the, the PPP funds and how that's handled and, and how, uh, asking employees to come back, whether they, they are willing to come back or not, that type of thing. So those were all great questions. I see quite a few uh, questions that are going into the chat. I'm gonna ask folks if they would uh, also put some of them, uh, put them into the Q&A so people can uh, address those directly. So thank you, Margaret, I appreciate it, um, the update. So I wanted to move over to uh, Jill uh, Beresford. Jill, are you on the line? Is that you on the phone? I see you're on mute. Somebody's on mute on this. Is that, 
Yep. Is oh, that that's you? me, Chris. I can't get audio, John Fitzpatrick. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. All right. So Jill, Jill is not on the line. Okay. If if uh, I know there were a couple of folks from MS, uh, the small Massachusetts Small Business Development Center, are supposed to be on the call. If uh, you're having difficulty, uh, reach out to uh, Lexi, and we'll get you uh, onto the call that way. Um, so I want to move then on to John Fitzpatrick. Uh, John is with us. Uh, John has been with the Massachusetts uh, uh, Supply Diversity Office uh, for seven years. Uh, he has been uh, stationed actually for many of those years uh, in the only satellite office of SDO in the Chamber's office in Brockton. Uh, it's a state agency you know, based in Boston, but uh, they have a satellite office right here in Brockton at the Chamber. And uh, he's been co-located with us. Uh, we have on a, a number of, uh, well, a number of times a year, we offer a certification for small businesses, uh, minority-owned, woman-owned, and veteran-owned. Uh, and they are able to be certified and do business with the state uh, through the bidding process. So, uh, John, first of all, welcome. And can you give us a little bit of uh, an update on, on uh, what SDO is doing, and how they're pivoting, and, and, and what's new? You're on mute, by the way. You're still on mute. Uh, okay, there, there I am. Okay, as long as you can hear me clearly. Okay. Um, thanks, Chris, um, for including the SDO in this panel. It's like, like you said, we, we've been coming down there for almost a decade now, actually. You've given us that office and it's, it's been really incredibly helpful having that satellite office for SDO and you know, the parent, our parent agency is the Operational <laughs> Service Division, OSD which is just in charge of procurement for the state. So this has been really helpful for this, this area for us to launch and have trainings, uh, visit companies. It's been fantastic, so thank you. Um, and like Chris said, my name's John Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Supplier Diversity Programs for the Supplier Diversity Office, the OSD Supplier Diversity Office. I also handle a lot of their construction projects. Um, like a lot of things, they're very quiet right now. Um, our, our office, I'll go into our certifications if people aren't quite familiar with us. We certify minority business enterprises, women business enterprises, veteran business enterprises, um, service disabled veteran business enterprises, disability owned business enterprises, Portuguese business enterprises, and LGBT uh, business enterprises. Um, they all go through our office. We, a, a couple of them go through a third partner, uh, some third partners we have. Um, but we're in full swing with certification. And, and in some ways, I've got to say, as maybe a lot of people have discovered, this, the video conferencing has opened up a whole new portal for us. That, um, I mean, I've been telecommuting. I live down outside of New Bedford and commute up to Boston. And the ability now to use this, and it's working for a lot of my colleagues in our office, we've never used it before in this capacity. And for us to conduct outreach, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of just laughing to myself. It's like, I'm telling people, okay, I am have a conference call tomorrow morning with a construction company interested in MBEWB goals. Um, it's, it's allowing us to give a lot more access to companies. It sounds like you've pivoted completely. In fact, I, I was talking to your office earlier today and they were telling us that they're offering what we usually offer in our office or next door at the Crescent Credit Union because they have a larger conference room. You're offering it on June 4th uh, via Zoom. So that's a certification program, right? Yeah, no, it's where before we were, you know, we were, we had to follow the fire code, which is understandable. You might get 50, you might get 40, you might get 90. We're getting, we're reaching capacity with Zoom um, of 200. Yeah. So, and, and then there's always the follow-up. Like I, on the chat room, I left my, uh, my name title, the SDO link. Um, I apologize. I forgot to, I put my number there, but I forgot to put the, my email until later on. So, but if anybody needs me or is interested in certification, um, I'm happy to answer questions, but yeah, it's, it's the access. Um, we're spending much more time with companies. I think they're getting a much better understanding of the certification and how to use it in the business world. And a lot of them have new opportunities now using this. And so they, I'm not to, gonna, when, once they're certified, ahead. they can qualify for state contracts, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And we can guide them a lot better now, but yes. 
They all got for state contracts and private sector contracts in construction. We helped a lot of companies work on the MGM, the Encore, and the Plain Ridge casino yeah. projects, as well as um, the Winthrop Square project. So and those required uh, by a certain percentage of minority or woman-owned uh, business co uh, contractors, correct? Yeah. 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 If they so, did, they used a lot. That's great. Well, I, I want to thank you for being here. It was kind of a last minute addition. I, I appreciate you joining us. And I, I know uh, your contact information is down below. I know the next certification workshop is via Zoom online mm -hmm. on the 4th. So if you're at home or you know somebody who falls into those categories uh, who might want to uh, qualify for state contracts, please, while you're home, participate in that June 4th uh, workshop and uh, move your business forward. So thank you, John. I appreciate it. Chris, could I add one thing just before I get off? Yeah. Not to, not to hog the, the panels. Um, we just got a new hire that a lot of, some people might know, and maybe the panelists know, um, Rob Williams, formerly of Mass Growth Capital Corporation, was just hired by the SDO as our new director of diversity and small business engagement. So yes, we're very, very happy to have Rob working with us. Yeah, many of us do know him, and uh, he also, we were just talking about MGCC because they offer the assistance to fill out your PPP application uh, in foreign languages and whatnot, so that's great. That's that one of the trained. reasons we bought him, yeah. yeah. Nice, nice uh, strategic hire. Good seeing you, John, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll stick around if you can. Uh, and Jill is here. Jill, welcome back. Uh, you and I shot a video probably seven weeks ago talking about some of what people need to do to prepare their business for the, the changes and the pauses and, and all that's going on as a result. And uh, we're delighted that you're back with us from the, Mass, from the Massachusetts Small Business Development Centers. Uh, so Jill, I just want to tell you a little about Jill. Uh, Jill has kind of been a turnaround agent for businesses of all sizes and all, all types over her career and has been with uh, the Small Business Development Centers for the last six years or so. Uh, she's really filled a lot of different roles uh, in private business and offers counseling and, and um, advice to small businesses uh, throughout the region and the state. So, uh, Jill, can you give us an update as to what, what's going on there? I know you, you, your agency and our agency were planning a couple of key programs in the next uh, 60 days. Those are probably not going to happen, but I know you're working on a lot of other things. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. It's nice to see you, Chris, and thanks for nice to see all the people on here that um, faces as well. So just a little bit about MSBDC. I would encourage everybody on the call to not only sign up for the chamber emails, but to sign up for the MSBDC emails. We can get you that information and also SBA.gov to stay on top of everything. Perhaps the most topical um, information that, that we're dealing with right now is where or what do I do with my PPP loan? Where is my EIDL loan? And Eli's on the call and I know he'll address that. So um, what do I do with my grant? And we're not hearing too much yet about what's next. The, the really, as I talked to you seven weeks or so ago, Chris, we talked about how once people got through their conversations with us and their fear level, 80% of them are gonna be fine. And I'm going to stand behind that. You know what? I'm, I'm going to stand behind that um, still and say that people, it's a new word out there called pivoting. I like to think of it as what do I do in a crisis, but pivots a lot shorter. <laughs> and people are remarkably resilient, creative. Small business in America is still working so hard to provide its goods and services. Are there certain areas being hammered more than others? Yeah. But are people reaching out with grant money? Towns, states, chambers, um, grant money, cheap loan money. I hear of a new program every single day. I learned of one this morning. High interest credit card debt consolidation. What a great program. And it's not being offered through a bank. And people need to hear these kinds of things. So I really encourage people to get on, on our, our mailing list, your mailing list and the SBA mailing list to stay tuned because no matter how COVID unravels and the post COVID world looks, people are still going to need help getting through the new normal. And that's what we all do. So that's kind of my five minute spiel. And so you're available to, to talk with folks, right? One-on-one -on -one via zoom now. 
Yeah, uh, I can do, I do virtual advising, yes. And a reminder to everybody who's on here, our services are free to the taxpayer. Right. The SBA pays 50%. The Mass Office of Business Development, I see Margaret's smiling face up there, helps offset the cost of it. So anybody who's facing any kind of business challenge, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, uh, make a call to our office and get onto a virtual Zoom call or cell phone call if you're not comfortable showing your face. And we will talk you through it. And there's no limit to how many times you can come. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so I know you mentioned the uh, high interest uh, debt uh, consolidation. During this, I'm sure people have pulled their credit card out a few times to try to get over the hump here of, of lack of cash flow. Is that a program that's being offered through Small Business Development Center or, or community? It's a program being offered through SEED in Taunton. You have, to, you have to go to your bank and say, I want to consolidate my credit card debt. And the bank's probably going to say no because banks make so much money on those interest rates. They don't want them consolidated. So once the bank says no, uh, you can contact SEED and discuss the possibility of getting up to 50K refinanced at six wow. percent interest rate over six years that's fantastic that's a great deal yeah, yeah that is a great deal yeah. seed was on uh and that's free too it's a free service yeah uh, all of these everybody that's on today is free uh they they uh, were on two weeks ago and they were talking about their traditional programs the 504 and the 7a that have had some incentives uh, created. And I'm sure Eli will touch on that too. Yeah. Uh, so that the six months of payments made by the federal government as part of this program. So Jill, thank you for being here. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Before we get to Eli, we, we're delighted to have Stephen Callister with us. Steve uh, is the, the head of the, uh, the chamber office for all of New England, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and West Virginia. I think I got everybody there. And he's located in Providence uh, is, is where the office is. And we, we deal with Steve for quite a bit. He was on the call a couple of weeks ago. We had one of his associates last week uh, talking with us about uh, some of the, the, the latest uh, developments, including uh, plans to get back to work. Because companies are saying, what do I do first? Am I going to need hand sanitizer? Do I have to do deep cleaning? Do I have to provide my staff or customers with masks? What, what do I need to do? And the U.S. Chamber has been doing a great uh, service by putting out, uh, ten, you know, model plans that companies of all sizes can look at and, and develop. So Steve, I, I see you're there. Uh, I can't see you, but are you ready to go? Yeah, ready to go. Um, sorry, it's last minute edition. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really handsome guys. I'm just uh, not uh, shaving right now. So I figured it'd be better off to. Uh, Thank you. For that. We and I were just talking. We talk almost, we're on, on the same calls every day. So I just mentioned to Steve that it'd be great to add him. Uh, so thank you for being here. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to touch on, on, on a few things, keep everybody updated. Um, the Senate was back this week. House is coming back next week. Um, the big talk now, phase four of the CARES Act. We're kind of in phase 3.5 um, in, in the CARES Act right now. That was the additional money for the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL loans. Um, we're hearing a number of different things we're keeping our eyes on, including including C6s in the next round, um, which is uh, Chambers of Commerce and other nonprofits to be eligible for the C6, I mean, for uh, the PPP. Um, there is a number of house bills that we are supporting um, from uh, your neighbor, Chris Pappas in, in New Hampshire. His bill seems to have the most uh, momentum. Uh, we came out in support of that and we actually did a joint uh, uh, press release with all the members, uh, both Republican and Democrat members that are supporting that. And Neil Bradley, our policy director, uh, did that. We're really trying to push that for C6s to be included in the next round uh, of um, funding for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program to make them eligible for that. For timing on that, on phase four, we do not expect to see anything before Memorial Day around that, uh, around that time. As I mentioned, the House is just coming back next week. The Senate, they took up just a lot of uh, confirmations uh, this week. So, um, you know, they have been moving fast for Congress time, but it's not really as fast as, as we would like. Um, the other thing I wanted to flag for everybody, I know you had Ron on last week and he talked a lot about of the, uh, our plan helping implement a national return to work. One of the things that we are really working on and, and trying to get some uh, standardization across the country as much as possible 
is on these liability issues if you're the employer. There's yep. going to be a lot of expectations on you when you when you are reopening your company or you're reopening. Um, we want to be there has to be some safeguards in there if you are trying to your best. If you are following certain guidelines, whether they're CDC guidelines or or, or, or state guidelines, if you are doing your best, there should be some um, protections in there for the employer so there isn't a number of uh, lawsuits. Um, we are already tracking these across the country. The lawsuits are coming at a huge pace, and it, it's really concerning uh, to us. Um, so the, the big things that we're looking at is health privacy. Everybody is talking about when you return to work, you may have to get your temperature checked. You may have to uh, um, have a uh, COVID-19 test already done. You have to, who's responsible? There's health privacy laws that are already in effect. So what can an employer ask? What can he not ask? We want some guidance and we want that to be across the board guidance. So it's not different in Massachusetts than in Rhode Island. It should be the same and it definitely should be the same in Brockton and Boston. It should be the same in, within the state at the very least. So, um, you know, discrimination claims, that is something that um, we're already hearing about. I used the example in Rhode Island, Governor Raimondo, uh, about two weeks ago when she was talking about reopening the economy, she said, well, we're going to have to do it in phases. And I believe, um, you know, if you're 60 years or above, you may not be able to go back to work when everybody else does. Well, she immediately had to walk that back because there's discrimination. You can't you can discriminate on age. So these are things we're trying to flush out before everybody gets uh, back into work because we're really concerned about these um, lawsuits that could be coming. Um, product liability, if you are uh, required to uh, provide a mask, what happens if it's not the correct mask? We need some guidance on these things. We need some protection for the employers. Again, um, medical liability, there's only so many questions that you can ask and, and how much of you are responsible as the employer. We need some guidance on that. And uh, the big one is exposure. That's, that's the big thing that we're working on right now, exposure liability because we're already finding that people that have returned to work or stayed on if they were at an essential business, if they have contracted the COVID, they are going back and, and, and saying they get retreated at work. Now, it's very hard to prove exactly where you received it, uh, where you got it. Was it at work or was it when you went somewhere on the weekend, somebody at home that got it, you got it from somebody else? It's, it's very difficult. So these are things that we're working on because it's going to have huge ramifications as the businesses ramp up. And um, you know they have a number of concerns as a business owners, as you know, and this is just added on there. So we are trying to get clarification, whether it's through uh, the Department of Labor, whether it's through uh, legislation, these, these things that we really uh, are working hard on and we are already tracking this. And, and that's just one thing I wanted to touch on to kind of flag that, because these are issues that every business is gonna be faced with uh, when they do reopen. Well, and that's a great update and a, and a great reason for folks to be aware and appreciative of the U.S. Chamber because you're addressing things ahead of uh, the time that we're going to need it and creating a, a resource. I know oftentimes you guys put together toolboxes that may uh, include, as I said, model policies or things to consider or sign-on letters uh, to help uh, Congress either avoid something that's going to impact business in a negative way or to implement something that would be uh, helpful to business. And so the U.S. Chamber, I, I think, as I stated last week, is the, is the largest uh, lobbying organization in the United States and uh, is situated right there across the street from the White House. So, uh, Steve, thanks for being with us. I really appreciate it. I know we're going to get into a lot of what the U.S. Chamber is getting into with Eli. Uh, Eli is talking about kind of the the programs, and I know there's a lot of questions on the other side, the folks receiving the benefit of the programs of businesses in terms of missteps on PPP and, you know, the eight weeks and when it starts and, and what the intent is to keep people, uh, people saying, why would I pay them if they're not coming in? And, and all of these questions now that, are, that are, are good questions to have because that means people have the money and they have it in their account. And now they're trying to decide, how do I spend this? How should I account for it and and what other changes are there going to be um eli's been great he's been with us for most of the weeks of this uh, call and uh, as i had mentioned he comes from a banking uh background and with credit unions and local banks community banks 
Uh, he, he made us aware of the 60 billion that was set aside for credit unions and banks. Uh, and and I, my understanding, uh, Eli, is, I know you're gonna get into probably some of this, is the uh, EIDL uh, portal is back open. And uh, there's a, maybe a particular uh, emphasis with some agriculture and Main Street uh, lending. Uh, so welcome, Eli. Uh, how are you? Well, Chris, good afternoon and good afternoon, everybody. Um, greatly appreciate the opportunity here to share some updates with you all. And, um, you know, uh, just just wanted to, you know, thank you, Chris, for, for putting this event together week after week. I know it's been, you know, it feels like a lot longer than it has actually been. Um, but uh, as Steve said, you know, I, I have worked from home for about seven weeks now. So it's not that I don't want to share my face. Uh, I, and, and I actually have shaved, but my computer doesn't have the ability to show video. So uh, in, the, in the absence of that, I am actually including a picture of me over here. Uh, just as, as I, I, I looked seven weeks uh, prior. Um, so uh, just to go over some of the data here and some of the information, for the most part, I'm going to be providing an update um, on the numbers. Some of this may be old news for, for the folks that have been with us the past few weeks, but I just I want to go over some of the funding from phase one through phase two to illustrate the progress. And, and truly, we have made tremendous progress. I, um, I say this wholeheartedly, and I've said it before, that we are you know, forever indebted to the lending community. I mean, they rose to the challenge, they, they made this happen for small businesses, and, and granted, you know, small businesses are their business. Um, but at the same time, you know, they, they really have done remarkable work. And, and uh, as an agency, we would not have been able to deliver on these programs were it not for uh, the help we've received from, from the banks, the credit unions, the entire lending community. So uh, I, I was just on, on a conference uh, that the National Association of Guaranteed Government Lenders put together from Wednesday to, to this uh, this morning. And uh, just amazing, amazing work when you think about it, when you hear from folks. There are lenders out there that have put, you know, close to 100,000 loans together. And when you think about that number, right, it, it represents, even for some of these larger banks, right, national institutions, it represents more than two and a half times the annual volume of lending that done in any given year, in their best year for that matter. And they've done it in a short, you know, uh, four weeks. So uh, truly, you know, kudos to, to, the, to the lending community once again, you know. Um, and I know, you know, nothing has been smooth and there's been challenges along the way, but at the same time, I think this, the PPP program has been a true success. So uh, let's dive into the numbers. I love numbers, as you probably can tell. I get excited when I talk about numbers. And uh, the report that I have in here, it, it encompasses the data from round one of funding. So the funding uh, lasted only 14, you know, as you know, in 14 days. Truly amazing. Um, looking at the state here, state counted for half of the numbers for the entire New England region. You know, 1.6 million small businesses were, were helped and, uh, you know, close to 5,000 5, lenders participated in the program. But like I said, I just want to illustrate some trends over here. And that's the reason I'm, I'm going over the same information over and over again. So on the first round of funding, you can see here the small dollar loans uh, counted for about 74% of the total. You know, 1.2 million uh, loans were actually uh, you know, made to small businesses for le for under $150,000 for an average loan size of about $206,000. But it gets better. Um, so I've got data here as of um, May 1st. So this was the first week that the round two of funding was in place. And you can see the lender, the number of lenders actually went up almost, you know, by 510% of the lenders participating in the first round of funding. You can see here, you know, in just a short week, $175 billion were lent to 2.2 million small businesses. Again, just want to illustrate here that Massachusetts, you know, still, you know, counts for half of the volume in, in the New England region, 
for almost 49,000 small businesses were helped in just the first uh, week of, of, of round two of funding. So truly remarkable. Uh, more data from phase two. So here I have it broken down by uh, the lender size. So this is something we pay close attention to because the, this round two of funding, as you mentioned, Chris, does have the $60 billion set aside for the smaller institutions. So um, institutions, you know, that, that were less than $50 billion in assets in here, as, as the chart shows, about 53% of the amount um, over a million dollars, you know, in, in approved loans. Um, the smaller institutions between 10 billion to 50 billion in assets, you know, again, good, you know, good number of, of, of units there approved. And then look at the, the lenders with less than $1 billion in, you know, assets, uh, an amazing, you know, 465,000 units approved. So the small banks. Incredible. Yes, absolutely. Uh, small banks, credit unions, non banks, truly, truly amazing numbers. When you think about the limited resources, when you think about, you know, uh, some of these institutions are uh, teams of, of three and four people. So for them, you know, uh, in speaking with the various lenders here in the state specifically, you know, for them, it's, it's years worth of their entire volume of lending. Uh, that they did in just you know this the short three or four weeks so uh, amazing you know I, I there's no other words to describe it uh so again some more data here so breaking down the loans um loans under fifty thousand dollars in this second round of funding do you know count for about 70 percent so think about it, it was under one hundred fifty thousand dollars in round one of funding that was 74 percent of it the second round of funding is loans under 50,000 that account for 70% of the units. So just, just unbelievable. Average loan size, you can see here, $79,000, okay? But it gets even better. Uh, so this is data that I, I was able to obtain as of last night. Okay, so this is, you know, as a close of business yesterday, you can see in here, average loan size is down to $74,000. So yeah. second week of phase two, even, even more loans made to the smaller, small businesses. So a really amazing, amazing work. Um, you can see here, here, here again, you know, uh, the numbers speak for themselves. But um, what I have in here is an update that you won't find anywhere else. So. I, um, I took the liberty to pull data for just the last week of uh, the idle approvals. And again, just wanted to show a trend over here. So I don't have dollars, but I have units. So you can see that the number of approvals has picked up significantly. So we went from, you know, almost nothing at the beginning of the month to 50 units to 170 units. And we're sort of, you know, plateauing there at the 170 units for the, the last few days. So um, just good news all, overall. I, I think, you know, the Office of Disaster Assistance is picking up, you know, the, the approvals. Um, and again, these loans are being approved on a first come, first serve, first serve basis. Okay, but these are the applications that were already submitted to the SBA. And Chris, you mentioned that we did reopen the, the portal. And uh, that portal is only open now to agricultural businesses. So the second round of funding uh, gave the agency some additional funds specifically for ag businesses. So um, no other small businesses can apply for an IDA loan with the exception of those agricultural businesses. Uh, just keep in mind, just for everybody, you know, um, we do not have funding you know, for, for uh, additional IDA loans at this time. So, but the folks that already submitted an application using, you know, either uh, system that we had in place, one of the three methods of submissions, you know, we will continue to process those, those applications. And uh, because it is a different division of the SBA, uh, this is where bureaucracy, you know, hasn't, hasn't really helped us or the small businesses. The, our office that falls under the Office of Capital Access, you know, uh, we really don't have access to the, those systems, to those platforms. We haven't been as much of a resource for, for small businesses here in the state, but 
now we, we do have a new uh, channel of communication with the ODA. Uh, we have been able to get some updates. So definitely uh, on this presentation that I will send out to, to Lexi and, and Chris for you guys to, 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 to post on, on, the, on your side or, or the, to share with the participants. Uh, our contact information is there as well. So um, if any one of you has been waiting more than four weeks to get a, to hear back uh, from, from the SBA, reach out to me directly. I'll make sure that you know, we, we go through our internal channels um, and, and uh, try to get you an update, okay? Thank you, Eli. And I, I know you and Susan have been terrific in uh, answering questions throughout the week. We get them at the chamber uh, in many different forms and we send them to you and you guys answer directly. So we really appreciate that. Uh, the e EIDL loan, are you saying, just for clarification, if someone in, went in early on and received some funds uh, as part of an advance, are they still okay to complete that application uh, or is it too late? No, so they're, they're, they're fine. They're in the queue. They're being, you know, they're going to, the SBA loan specialists are going to get to the loan in the order received. So the fact that people got the advance, that, that's good news. Uh, it's step one of many. So usually seven to 10 business days after they get the, the advance, uh, they're going to get an email from the SBA saying, here's what we need or here's what we got you approved for. Okay. okay. If they, if some of them are asking me if they want to go for more. In other words, if they went for 10,000, which many, I guess, businesses went for the advance, uh, if they're now realizing they need 30 or 40, uh, can they go back and apply for the IDL through because they've got, they're in the queue with that initial? So, so just, just so everybody is on the same page, when you apply for an IDL loan, you do not specify a loan amount. Right. Uh, so the advance of up to $10,000 was based on the number of employees that people entered on the application. And the advance that people got uh, those who did receive it was a thousand dollars per employee that was listed. Right. If you entered zero on the application, you only got a thousand dollars for yourself as as the sole, you know, the the uh, owner of the business. So, uh, the, you know, so those are some of the most common questions that we're getting. Is well, I didn't apply for this. Um, I applied for more, but there's no place on that application where you could have entered a dollar amount the loan specialist at the SBA is going to do their own analysis and they're going to determine how much the business qualifies for. Ah. Usually we've been saying anywhere between four to six months of working capital needs. Okay. And in order for them to make the determination, they may need additional paperwork. And if somebody says, gets approved for a specific dollar amount and they need more, they can certainly provide additional documentation to the loan specialist once they're contacted. And, um, you know, they can go from there. So um, just prove their case and, and tell the folks at the SBA that here's what, you know, uh, what our needs are truly are. Okay. So I have another question that came in uh, recently. Before I, I get to that, I want to remind people that that testing site at the high school is available to any community, all communities. I just got an email from the testing site. I guess they're on the call. And they said that anyone who's an essential worker uh, from any of the communities surrounding Brockton and Brockton uh, is now being accepted there. So the, I think the mayor was correct on the early days and now it's expanded maybe. And uh, anyway, get that word out if you're an essential worker and you think you have uh, a need for the test or you have symptoms, you're displaying symptoms, then you're able to drive right back, drive into the parking lot of the high school right off at uh, route, uh, route 123, off of Route 24, exit 17 and get that test. So this question came, uh, this is from a museum. They're asking, can they apply for both the EIDL and the PPP program to cover different expenses? And I guess that could apply not just to a museum, but a small business too. So uh, the first question that I, I would ask back, and, and I uh, have a tendency to ask, to respond to a question with a question is, is the museum one of those uh, for profits or a non profit entity? And if they are a non profit entity, are they one of the uh, eligible uh, entities for PPP funding? I believe and if the they are. Those are yes, both. Yes. Yeah, so, so if they are a 501c3 or, or a 501c19, then um, they are eligible for, for both. And any one small business owner can have both 
or apply for both EIDL and PPP funds. Okay. The purpose, however, of the funds have to be, you know, separate. It has to be for, for um, you know, if the Paycheck Protection Loan Program is for payroll costs, the EIDL has to be for working capital needs, excluding payroll. So that is, the, you know, the thing people need to keep in mind and, and obviously to document the use of funds. Because at the end of the day, for PPP loan forgiveness, you will need to, to provide documentation as to how you use the funds. Right. You know, the cost that you incurred and payments you made to prove that those were for el eligible use of loan proceeds. Okay. I've got another one here. Is there a new maximum cap for EIDL loans from 2 million to 150? Uh, it's, th th I've heard the, the same rumor, but it has not been official yet. So until it gets announced uh, officially from the ODA, um, we're, we cannot confirm nor deny. But what you can say is uh, that the average loan amount has seemingly has come way, way down and is reaching the small business owners through PPP. Absolutely through PPP, but for the EIDL, um, some of the loans we we've seen that it got approved are in the half a million dollar range. So um, that's why I, I'm a little reluctant to say that the 150 is the new cap, but anything's possible. And again, like I said, we haven't gotten the best, you know, communication and we haven't had the best communication channels with the Office of Disaster Assistance, which is a little unfortunate, but that's, that's an interagency thing. There's a question here. I'm not sure if you can answer. This is about 401ks. Uh, you know, the PPP funds that are paid employees, if there's a 401k match or a 401k contribution on regular wages, do they apply to the unemployment or the PPP wages as well? Does the employer have to pay that? So um, that is part of, of payroll expenses, the payroll costs as identified to, you know, the, uh, in, on the internal final rule published on, on um, you know, April 2nd. So actually just wanted to go over this next slide. So our, well, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, it's all right, Chris, that's quite all right. So just want to share with folks here real quick, the program rules, two of the best websites with all the information are the SBA's website, and that is sba.gov forward slash paycheck protection or home.treasury.gov forward slash cares, like the CARES Act. So uh, I'm just showing here for everyone who can who is logged in using Skype. Um, this is all the program rules, you know, from the first issuance date on the internal final rule, which was posted on the 2nd of April, all the way through the last internal final rule that was posted on the 5th of May, right? Um, it's, it's all in there. It's available to the public. I think every small business owner needs to at least, at least, read you know this frequently asked questions which is the very first link on the page okay 45 questions the most frequently asked questions everybody needs to read that if you got a ppp loan that's the first place you want to go that's the first thing you want to read that's a great resource because we get endless call, calls and emails about the anticipating what will qualify and what won't and people don't want to misstep and i, I don't blame them uh, we're telling them to put it in a separate account, uh, you know, a business account that they have and, uh, and track the expenses that way so that you can easily explain why funds were expended and what they were for. Um, there was a question about what uh, allowable expenses, not just the 401k, but I'm not seeing it now. I think it had to do with uh, oh, workers' comp insurance, the, the actual premium. Would that be allowable under PPP? Maybe that's one of the Q&A. And Chris, again, that's, that's information that's addressed in there as well. Okay, that's great. Perfect. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for participating today, uh, all those who called in, and especially our panelists who have uh, acted as a great resource for our business community here in the Metro South region. Uh, delighted to have you uh, on, on the call and, and assisting in, in the way that you do. It's great that you've all pivoted uh, to uh, online, and it's great that the resources that – you know, once we're available face to face at the chamber, are still available uh, face to face through uh, Zoom, and that uh, uh, all of the folks on the panel today are willing to meet with you that way. Again, I want to remind folks that that testing site is open to everyone uh, that's an essential worker, whether it's a cleaning company, uh, a gas station, uh, auto parts place, a hospital, 
uh, any of those essential uh, can get tested there. So there is a phone number, I believe, uh, down below and a way to get a referral. So you, you can't just show up. I guess you have to have a referral and then you can drive up and then be tested and then get your response within uh, uh, two days. So in our, in our upcoming calls, we plan to be back here next Friday and the Friday after, all the Fridays in May so far, we're scheduling out. We have Congressman uh, Lynch, who we've been in contact with. We're expecting him to confirm uh, either for next week or the week after. Also, uh, Ed Markey, Senator Ed Markey, uh, we're in contact with them. And Secretary of Economic Development and Housing, Mike Keneally, uh, we're hopeful that he will join us as well. Friday the 22nd at 2 o'clock, uh, normally that's the week we have our Small Business of the Year. That's our... Uh, this is May, May of Small Business Month, and uh, we hope to celebrate two businesses on the call, if you would indulge us, just so that we continue our momentum and not skip uh, award ceremonies and skip recognitions, but work them into uh, where we already are and where we already are uh, present uh, to kind of remind us of the positives. And uh, we have some great businesses that have been nominated, and uh, we look forward to May 22nd when we acknowledge them. That's the day before Memorial Day weekend. But I have a feeling most people are going to be staycationing, uh, so hopefully we'll we'll have you all on the call and uh, at two o'clock that day as well. So I want to thank you all once again. I hope you have a safe and healthy uh, uh, weekend, and uh, for all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Chris. Great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.